Okay, so in section 310 in our book, we're going to learn some applications of the chain rule or applications of implicit differentiation. Um, related rates, uh, you'll see several examples of what th that means and what they look like. Uh, but before you see those examples in the uh, next few videos, I want to start with just some background information that will make, I think, those other videos a little bit more clear to you. So let's start with just a little bit more practice with the chain rule. When we learned the chain rule, and when we learned implicit differentiation, we saw that if we wanted to do the derivative of something like a function raised to the seventh power, this is really just kind of an extension of our power rule. According to the power rule, the derivative would be seven times whatever that inside function is to the sixth power, and then I have to multiply by the derivative of that inside function. Which sometimes we also write as, sorry, f prime. Now, one thing I'll mention, uh, you're probably used to using x as your independent variable. So we're used to doing the derivative with respect to x instead of the derivative with respect to t. But really, the name of our independent variable doesn't really matter. Uh, I could be working with x's, I could be working with t's, I could be working with whatever letter we want to choose. All that's important is that we're doing the derivative with respect to the variable t here, and so we just follow our basic rules. Um, and this is pretty typical with applications. In applications, things tend to depend on time. So if things are depending on how much time has gone by, then we have a function of t for time. So part of what I wanted to show you with this example is um, not just the idea of the chain rule, but also the idea that we're going to be doing derivatives with respect to t in this section. This next example, the derivative with respect to t of y to the seventh, is really no different from the one I did just a second ago, because that y, we're going to think of it as representing some function of t. Okay, so according to the chain rule, again, it's just like we did before. It's 7 times y to the 6th, but then y is some function of t, and I'm doing the derivative with respect to t, so I need to finish by multiplying by the derivative of that inside function, dy dt. Okay, so really these two examples on this page are basically the same thing. Um, <clears throat> we've got some function of t raised to the seventh power, and we did the derivative with respect to t. I'll also mention, again, this dy dt can also be written as y prime. It doesn't really matter. They mean the same thing. To really just emphasize the point that um, it doesn't matter what letter we work with, it could be f of t, it could be y, it could be a, it could be theta. All that matters is that we're doing the derivative with respect to t, and we're thinking of these letters as being functions of t. All right, so these again are just really no different from what we did on the previous page. The derivative of this function of t with respect to t is going to be 7 times that function to the 6th power times the derivative of the inside function, dA dt. Sticking with this pattern, the derivative with respect to t of theta to the seventh power, power is going, again going to just be 7 times theta to the sixth power, but then you have to multiply by the derivative of that inside function, d theta dt. All right, so really all I've done here is the exact same example four times, uh, just to emphasize the point that we can do the derivative with respect to t of whatever we, letter we want to name our function. So what we're going to do here is, um, same as the last few slides, we're going to treat
treat all these variables that we see as functions of t. So here again this is kind of uh, unusual from what we're accustomed to. We're doing the derivative with respect to t of x to the seventh. This isn't the derivative with respect to, with respect to x, it's the derivative with respect to t, where we're thinking of x as being some function of time, t. So just like the last four examples, again this is really no different from those, the derivative with respect to t of x to the seventh is 7x to the sixth times dx dt, the derivative of that inside function with respect to time. This next example, the derivative of tangent theta, where again theta is some function of time. I'm going to do the derivative with respect to t of tangent theta and I get secant squared theta like I normally would, but then according to the chain rule, I have to do, uh, I have to multiply by the derivative of the inside function, so times d theta dt. This last one, again, both of these variables represent functions of time. I have, you could think of this as being h of t times r of t squared. Now since this is a product, I'll need the product rule to do the derivative. According to the product rule, we can start by doing the derivative of h, that's just the derivative of h with respect to t, dh dt, and leave that r squared alone. And then we add to that just the opposite. Now we leave the h alone and do the derivative of r squared. Now in this case, the derivative of r squared is two times r to the first power, but again, don't forget, r represents some function of t and we're differentiating with respect to t. So we finish by doing the derivative of that inside function, the derivative of r, dr dt. Okay, so these are all just, again, extensions of the chain rule. Um, and uh, really no different from what we saw in the first two slides. You do your regular derivative rule, but then multiply by the derivative of the inside function. Let me quickly explain to you why we want to differentiate with respect to t. What you'll be seeing with your related rates is some kind of geometric shape, and these geometric shapes will be changing, or their size will be changing as time goes by. For example, Suppose we have some person traveling due east, we'll call this person A, and we have some other person tra traveling due north, we'll call this person B. Since these people are traveling, A is not really just A, it's A of t, it's a function of time. B also changes as time is, and time is going by, so you could think of that as being a function of t as well. As you know, the derivative of a function tells you how fast something is changing, or the rate of change for that function. So here if we write dA dt, we're talking about how fast person A is moving. So for example, if I said dA dt equals 5 miles per hour, then that tells me that person A is moving at a rate of 5 miles per hour. That's how fast they're moving. Okay. <clears throat> Similarly, we could talk about how fast b is changing. So if I do the derivative of b with respect to time, t, I'm describing for you how fast b is changing. Now, something you'll see in some of your examples is uh, you're going to take these two people are, that are traveling in different directions and look at the distance between them. So then let's call this distance c. And just like the other two, since A, person A and person B are traveling um, and their distances are changing as time goes by, then the distance between them is changing as well. So this is also a function of time. And if it's a function of time, we can also talk about how fast C is changing as time goes by. We could look at dc dt. 
So on those previous slides, whenever we have things like uh, d theta dt or dA dt or whatever showing up, that's the idea. We're going to have some kind of geometric shape and when we do the derivative, we're getting these pieces uh, to the shape. We're getting different rates of change for different pieces to the sh uh, whatever geometric shape we're dealing with. The shape could be a triangle, like it is in this case. It could be a circle. It could be a cone. Whatever the geometric shape is, we're going to be dealing with shapes that change as time goes by. And the idea of related rates is we have different rates of change showing up in this shape. And the related rate question tells you to use the relationship between these rates. How are these rates related to each other? That's why they're called related rates. So for example, with a circle, we could be dealing with a circle of radius r, but r could be changing as time goes by. So in this case, r, again, is a function of t, so we could talk about how fast r is changing, dr dt. How fast r changes has an impact on how fast things like the area of the circle changes, or how fast the circumference of the circle changes. And so then you could write some equation that relates those rates to each other. We could look at the relationship between between dr dt and, let's say, dA dt, if A represents the area of the circle. If the radius is changing as time goes by, then the area of the circle is changing as time goes by as well. We could relate those two rates to each other. So again, this could be turned into a related rates question, because we have different rates of change, and we want to look at how they are related to each other. This is what you'll be seeing in your examples in the next few vi videos. What we've done so far in this video is basically lay the foundation for working related rates. In the next few videos that you'll watch, uh, you'll see a few examples of related rates questions and see how they're worked. Before you watch those videos, I wanted to just kind of outline for you the procedure that you'll see uh, being used in those examples. Pretty much every example that you'll see will basically follow this procedure, even if they don't explicitly say it as they're doing it. The first thing you'll see uh, being done in the examples is they're going to draw some kind of diagram and define variables. Uh, so what this will look like, uh, let's go back to that example with the right triangle we had on the previous slide, where we had someone traveling due east and due north. <clears throat> working this example, we can start by drawing a diagram that represents this physical situation, and suppose we want to talk about how fast the distance between these people are changing. Drawing this picture is kind of this first step in working whatever question it is you have. When I say define your variables, I mean label the dimensions of whatever geometric shape you have. So, like we did on the previous slide, I'll just call these sides A, B, and C. What letters we choose don't really matter. I could have called these sides X, Y, and Z. It doesn't matter. Uh, all that matters is we know that these three sides are the dimensions of the triangle, and those are changing as time goes by. So I have my shape, or my diagram, and I've defined the variables or the dimensions of that shape. And then once I've done that, I can move on to the next step. The next step, step two, says to use some kind of geometric or trigonometric uh, formula to write an appropriate e equation. So for example, if we're talking about the lengths of the sides of a right triangle, then probably a pretty uh, useful equation would be uh, Pythagorean theorem. We know that a squared plus b squared equals c squared. This is just some equation that we know that relates the variables that we wrote down in step one. 
this equation is particularly useful if we're dealing with some kind of question involving the lengths of the sides of the triangle. If we're dealing with angles in a triangle, then maybe uh, Pythagorean theorem doesn't make as much sense, and maybe something involving trig would make more sense. Um, but the key is to pay attention to what the context is and pick the appropriate equation. If we're dealing with a circle and how fast the radius is changing versus how fast the area is changing, then maybe a equals pi r squared, the area of a circle, would be the appropriate equation to write down in this step. Once you've done these first two steps, you've drawn a diagram and defined your variables, and then you write down the appropriate geometric or trigonometric equation. The third step is to differentiate both sides. And here, make sure you understand we're differentiating both sides with respect to t. Okay, if we're differentiating with respect to t, we would treat this as implicit differentiation. And uh, just like we saw in, at the beginning of the video, uh, this is essentially the chain rule. So in this particular example, if I want to differentiate both sides with respect to t, I would have 2a times the derivative of the inside function, dA dt, plus 2b to the first power times the derivative of that inside function times db dt equals 2c times dc dt. So if I differentiate both sides of that equation with respect to t, this is what I get. Once you've done that, you'll be able to move on to step four and plug in specific numbers. So exa for example, if I tell you how fast person A was moving, then I can plug that speed in here. If person A was moving at five miles an hour, then I know that dA dt is five, and in this case, I just plug five in where I see dA dt. If I tell you that person B is moving at 10 miles an hour, then I can just plug in 10 for db dt. So the idea here is you'll take the derivative first and then plug in whatever specific numbers you can and solve for whatever is missing. The important thing here um, is going to be doing this in the correct order. Uh, one of the most common mistakes I see in related rates questions is people mix up the order of three and four. They'll try to plug numbers in first and then do the derivative. If you plug numbers in first and then do the derivative, nothing works out right. Because then you're just doing derivatives of constants and you're just going to get a bunch of zeros showing up. That's not what we want. So order is important here. You differentiate first and then plug in specific numbers. Okay, so now would be a good time to move on to the next few videos to see some examples of how this works.